All right, our next speaker is Dr. Dan Gillen. Dan is professor and chair of the Department of Statistics at UCI. He's uh, also a member of the program in public health and an adjunct professor in uh, the Department of Epidemiology. In the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Dan is the leader of our data management statistics core where he has the near impossible job of making everyone else's studies better by improving their design and, and helping us uh, better analyze our data. Dan is also a gifted trialist, and he's recognized for his acumen in specifically the analysis of trials and the design of trials. He serves on numerous data safety and monitoring boards, evaluating the safety of ongoing clinical trials nationally and even internationally, and he's been on multiple FDA advisory panels that um, have instrumental roles in deciding which drugs get approved and which do not. Lastly, he's a fantastic teacher of trials, and I've been fortunate to learn from him in my years at UCI so far. He's taught me immensely about trial design and analysis, and I've asked him to teach you, as he has me, about the fundamental principles that go into it as, uh, designing a clinical trial. So Dr. Dan Gillen. Great. Thank you, Josh, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, special thanks to uh, Frank and Jim and Josh for their leadership in organizing today's event. I think it's a truly fantastic event. I think the topic is absolutely critical, as Dr. Cummings had mentioned and Josh alluded to when he began. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Alzheimer's Southern California, of Orange County and uh, UCI Mind and the staff for putting everything together. It's a tremendous amount of work to do this and much appreciated for us. Uh, so when you guys heard professor and chair of statistics, for those of you that started having panic attacks and like, you know, reverting back to that statistics course you once took, this is not going to be a statistics talk per se. Um, but what I'm going to attempt to do, you know, Josh asked me to, to in some sense, give a Clinical Trials 101. Um, and so I'm going to speak somewhat broadly about the role of clinical trials in the overall objectives of, of medical research um, and where they come into play and their importance. And to focus in on the fundamental aspects of solid clinical trials design. And, and my hope for you is that when you hear these things and these principles that you will come back to Dr. Cummings' talk and think about the aspects of what he has mentioned, those types of outcomes, trial duration, selection of patient populations, and what the importance of that is. And then also, as you listen to the speakers coming through in the day, please try and reflect upon these things, because these are the challenges that we face in designing trials, and our goal ultimately is to take a sample in a trial and then generalize that to a population so that we can truly treat the population and the public health impact. That's where statistics comes from, and that's why there's statistical thinking throughout the clinical design process, and so that's what I'm going to hopefully focus on for you all and, and, and allow you to have a bit of an appreciation for the reasons and the decisions that we make in trial design. So when I think about the goals of medical research, I think of four very broad areas. These are not a partition of the space, and what I mean by that is they clearly interlink with one another. Um, but our goals generally are to identify risk factors for disease in general. They are to identify treatments for disease. They are to identify strategies for prevention of disease, which you will hear about a little bit later in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And they are basic science. Basic science allows us and informs us to, um, to make inroads on all of these aspects as we go through from the lab and animal model science setting. And so, I like to think about the role of trials as I think about, well, what is the chronology of scientific investigation that we go through, okay, when we're doing medical studies? Many of our hypotheses are derived from anecdotal observations. They are the quote unquote case study that we're seeing in patients. And these are absolutely critical. They lead us to new hypotheses as we're moving along in our knowledge of a particular disease area and its natural history and sometimes even the definition of it. But there's some things to keep in mind when we think about anecdotal observations, and a little bit of this has to go with what Dr. Cummings mentioned about subgroup analyses and choosing things that happen to look good even though you didn't pre-plan for looking at those things to begin with. And that's where the anecdotal observations come in. Uh, 
Sir R.A. Fisher, who is, who is by all rights the father of modern statistics, um, has a fantastic quote on anecdotal evidence and, and case studies. Uh, he had a colleague of his, a very bright colleague, who came to him and said, look at this evidence that I have for treatment of a new disease. And R.A. Fisher's comment was, that is not an experiment you have there, that is an experience. And that is absolutely true. The idea is that that is not generalizable outside of the setting. The acclaimed economist today, Roger Brenner, has, has a slightly better way of putting it, I would say, and that is that the plural of anecdote is not data. In other words, fishing and choosing those observations over and over again does not necessarily support that hypothesis and its generalizability. So we need to go farther with these concepts. But that's often where we will begin to generate these hypotheses, but we don't end there, certainly. We also begin oftentimes with preclinical experiments. Um, Dr. Cummings mentioned Frank's work in the lab, animal studies of mechanism toxicology. They're absolutely critical. They help us to identify the underlying pathways for disease. Taking that knowledge about the underlying pathways for disease helps us then to hopefully try and translate that to humans and the clinical experience of humans. And so that's how we will we'll move through the system in a natural history manner. Where we then often will go is the quote-unquote observational study, and part of this is to get down terminology for us. Dr. Cummings mentioned a couple, or Cummings mentioned a couple of observational studies. Um, the two primary tools that we have in terms of design of observational studies are, one is we, we call it a, a completely retrospective design. It's a case control study. So when we're trying to study factors for a rare disease or potential interventions for a rare disease, we will often sample diseased individuals and then we will match them to non-diseased individuals and we will compare the factors that they have in common or that they do not have in common. Those factors they do not have in common may be targets for intervention or risk factors for disease at the end of the day. The alternative type of observational study is a cohort study where we will oftentimes prospectively follow individuals until the time that we've observed the disease in them. And this becomes more efficient for common diseases where you're likely to observe the disease occur over time. So I'm going to show you some examples where well-designed observational studies have provided quote-unquote evidence, but it is not until we do the randomized clinical trial that we really learn about what's happening with a particular intervention. So, that's really where the, the well-designed interventional study comes into play. In a clinical trial, what are we doing? We are assigning subjects to treatments. We are intervening in the process, hence not the observational but interventional study aspect of this. And then we are prospectively examining outcomes. That allows us to look at multiple responses. It allows us to assess efficacy, and it allows us to assess safety in a, in a clinical trial. And the most important element of this is that a well-designed clinical trial can then also allow us to infer cause and effect, which is something that I could not get out of the previous settings, the observational settings or the anecdotal evidence settings. So when we think about the goals of clinical trials, of course, this is experimentation in human volunteers. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to investigate new treatments or preventative agents, and we really have three kind of goals here, and I divided the last two purposely for you. So we, we do think about, obviously, about safety. The clinical trial is the one place where we can, in a controlled setting, observe and estimate the safety profile of a new experimental treatment. Once we have gone into the general population and we're in an observational study setting, we have what is called confounding, and so the safety signals that we see may be differential depending upon who's getting treated and who's not and the reason they're getting treated. So it may be driven by something other than the mechanism of interest. Efficacy is the concept of saying, does the treatment beneficially alter the disease process? You can think about it almost as like a perfect compliance type of idea. In other words, if I gave a therapy to an individual and they used it exactly like I wanted them to. They didn't miss treatments. They did everything that they were exactly supposed to do. Could you biologically alter that disease process? That's what we're talking about in efficacy. But we all know that humans aren't perfect, right? And therapies often have nasty side effects. 
They can bring on nausea, for example. They can bring on things that don't necessarily lend themselves to perfect compliance all the time, where patients are always following their directions on things. That's where effectiveness comes in. The concept of effectiveness, when we talk about it in a clinical trials and in a regulatory setting, what we are talking about with effectiveness is saying, if we were to adopt a new therapy into the population, would it benefit the population overall? In other words, marginally, and how people are going to use it. Some people are going to use it imperfectly. Some people are going to use it off-label. And we want to see long-term how that would benefit the overall disease process. Okay, so that's, that's the distinction between when we talk about efficacy and effectiveness. Now, when we think about investigating existing therapies, which we often do in clinical trials as well, really what we're talking about is relative benefit there. So we're looking for whether one treatment is clearly superior to another treatment in the clinical trial setting. And we are also looking at harm. Should a therapy currently in use be removed from the market? And we have done this, and we've had to do this. We've had to go back and reinvestigate certain therapies in the clinical trial setting because we still have quote unquote equipoise, meaning we don't really know the answer. So we need to do the controlled trial setting in order to determine if there truly is a harmful signal that's associated with a the therapy. So this has happened as well. So I'm gonna use a couple of examples to try and motivate the need for randomized clinical trials. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be slightly different from the rest of the speakers on today's agenda because I work in lots of different areas. So, so some folks were talking about, well, if we find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, all the researchers in here are going to be jobless. Well, luckily I, I won't be actually. So it turns out there are gonna be other diseases and trials that I will be working on. But, so I'm, I'm really rooting for the cure here. Um, but my experience as a trialist and throughout other diseases also, in my opinion, gives me a perspective on where things can go right and where things can go wrong. And so I'm going to give a couple of examples outside of Alzheimer's disease and allow them to inform us, if you will, about how we're designing trials in the AD area. Um, so the first one, and these are pretty high profile examples, is the role of vitamin C in reducing the risk of coronary heart disease. So some of you may have read about this. So there were multiple observational studies that came out in the late 90s and early 2000s that said and found, in fact, that there was a protective effect of antioxidant vitamins on cardiovascular disease. Okay? These were well reported in, in very good journals, for example, The Lancet. Right? And so CAW in 2001, they had estimated that there was a 30 to 37 percent reduction in cardiovascular disease specific mortality over a five-year period, and that 30 and 37 percent were respectively in males and females. So a very promising result. This was a very well done, by all means at the time, observational study. Okay? Um, what it does, though, is it motivates individuals to say, yeah, and maybe we should look at this in a more controlled setting so that we can have a bit more confidence in this estimate that's here. So the heart protection study of antioxidant vitamin supplementation came out just a year later where they looked at this specific hypothesis. And so this was a controlled, placebo-controlled randomized trial testing this very hypothesis. And what you see is the two yellow arrows, those are what I quoted you just a moment ago from the EPIC study. EPIC stands for the Epidemiologic Prospective Investigation of Cancer and Nutrition Study. Okay. Um, so that was the, the 0.7 there represents a 30% reduction in the risk of mortality over five years with respect to CHD. So that's one minus 0.7. And the one minus 0.63 that occurs in women that you're seeing on the bottom yellow arrow is a 37% observed reduction in coronary heart disease. Well, when we looked at the heart protection study and we did the placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial, that's in red there, what did we see? Well, we saw no statistically significant difference. The point estimate was slightly actually above one. So it's going the other direction, okay? When we looked at vitamin C use in CHD. That's the utility of the controlled clinical trial. This was not picked up in the, artificial, in the observational study setting. Okay? Why wasn't it? These were good researchers. These were good epidemiologists doing that study. Well, they controlled for lots of things to try and balance the groups using vitamin C and not. But one of the things they didn't adjust for in that original analysis, they didn't adjust for socioeconomic and lifestyle factors. 
turns out those have a big impact on coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. And when you go back to that original EPIC study, that observational study that was there, what you found was statistically significant differences in lifestyle and socioeconomic factors as a function of vitamin C use. Individuals that were using more vitamin C's had lower risk factors from a lifestyle perspective. And when you adjusted for those things, that effect went away on the cardiovascular disease. And again, where does the clinical trial come from? Oh, it's because we're randomly intervening now. I'm not allowing the lifestyle factors to be differential between my treated and untreated groups. And that's the goal there. So another one, and I'm sure many of you in this room have heard about, is hormone replacement therapy. This is a classic example as well. This one was a little harder to get at in terms of why we might have seen differences, but we certainly did. So if you think pre-1995, if you had postmenopausal women, it was almost automatic. You know, hormone replacement therapy was the wonder drug, and they would, you would be put on. And so that's because observational research to the time consistently suggested that there was about a 40 to 50 percent reduction in coronary heart disease and in incidence among users of hormone replacement therapy. So rightfully so, the NIH was a little bit concerned about so many prescriptions for hormone replacement therapy based upon observational data. And so they initiated the Women's Health Initiative study. That was an over 20,000 person study to investigate the specific hypothesis of whether estrogen plus progesterone or estrogen alone reduce the risk of coronary heart disease and what its impact also was on breast cancer primarily. And so this was again a randomized study. What happened with the Women's Health Initiative, whoops, let me go back quickly, sorry was that that study was actually didn't even come to completion. It was stopped early. And it was stopped early for safety for hormone replacement therapy. So the DSMB, which I will talk about a little bit more, that's the Data Safety Monitoring Board. They are the individuals that actually have unblinded access to the data in order to protect the ethics of patients as they're going through the clinical trial process. They were consistently monitoring the rates of cardiovascular disease, venous thrombosis, breast cancer, et cetera, that was associated with the experimental therapy. Again, the hypothesis here is that we would decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. What the Data Safety Monitoring Board observed was, though, is that we were increasing it. It was going the opposite way. And so if you look at a comparison of estrogen plus progesterone, that's E plus P, and the randomized clinical trial versus the observational study setting, and if we look at coronary heart disease, which was one of the primary indications for stopping the WHI randomized clinical trial, what you can see is that when you look at the <laughs> randomized clinical trial, you see an increase of approximately 20% in the risk of coronary heart disease. And the WHI was simultaneously looking to see if they can confirm the observational study evidence as well. So they ran an observational study as well on over 50,000 women. Well, what did the observational study say? Oh, it went right back to what they had pre-hypothesized with the other observational studies. It was showing a decreased risk of coronary heart disease of approximately 30%. So now you have the randomized study study saying this is harmful and you have the observational studies saying this is protective. So what's the rationale here? What's the difference? Well, it's been looked at in many possible ways to investigate what this difference is. The first one, the natural one, is like in the EPIC study, whether there was something we call unmeasured confounding. In other words, were there imbalances in the groups with respect to some factors that would have dictated their risk for coronary heart disease? So that's, that's kind of an obvious place to go. The next was the outcome ascertainment was slightly different in the randomized clinical trial versus the previous observational study settings. Because the randomized clinical trial was so meticulous in its design, women were, were regularly scanned and they picked up on quote unquote silent MIs, so not clinical MIs, so MIs without clinical symptoms. So that may have had an impact. Some individuals in the literature said, well, you know, the observational studies look at all formulations and doses of estrogen plus progesterone, and you're looking at one specific one, and so maybe that's the difference. But 
by far, the most convincing evidence says that there was something called a survival bias that we were not picking up in the observational studies. And that would have been very hard to pick up, I would argue, a priori in an observational study. And what I mean by the survival bias is that individuals, if we look down at the bottom here, this was the proportion of individuals that had never used estrogen plus progesterone in either the randomized study or in the observational study setting. So the first two columns are the randomized study setting. The last two columns are the observational study setting. And what you see, if I highlight that, so the, that top row is never users, what you see is that the randomized clinical trial setting was designed to pick up naive users. In other words, it was saying, it was asking the question, what will happen to the risk of coronary heart disease if I start a woman on hormone replacement therapy? She hadn't been using it before. The observational study settings, though, you notice that there in the controls, a lot of women had already been using hormone replacement therapy at the start of the, the time they started following them. The result of that statistically means that when you start to capture them in your data set, you've eliminated the women that potentially have already experienced mortality, for example, from coronary heart disease. So if there's an early deleterious effect of hormone replacement <laughs> therapy, you will never observe them in the observational study setting because you haven't done this by design. Similarly, in the greater than five years, you can see that in the observational study setting, a lot of women had already been on for greater than five years in the observational case. So does this hypothesis pan out? Well, you can see it actually when you look at the risks of coronary heart disease and you stratify by the length of time that women had actually been on the drug. In other words, who survived past two years, two years to five years, past five years on the drug. And when you do that, you can see that now my relative risks, oops, that are in the randomized clinical trial setting are actually roughly equal to the, ra the relative risks for coronary heart disease in the observational data setting. Ah, that's because we've now learned what to control for. It's the amount of time that those women had been on drug. And again, that would have been a very, very difficult thing to pick up a priori in the observational study setting. No one was thinking about this at the time when they were doing this and reporting these 37% reductions, for example, in coronary heart disease. But it was the RCT, the randomized clinical trial, that allowed us to observe this and actually draw this inference. A little bit more appropriate for today's meeting, coronary heart disease was certainly the big takeaway message from the Women's Health Initiative, but the same thing happened with dementia. So the Women's Health Initiative ran the dementia sub-study, and what had happened prior to that is that previous observational studies, just like with coronary heart disease, had reported a 30 to 35 percent reduction in the risk of dementia among estrogen plus progesterone users. When they ran the randomized clinical trial and looked at dementia as an onset, what they saw was the survival curves that are sitting over to the right there, approximately a two-fold increase in the risk of dementia associated with E plus P. Now, the likely scenario there, again, is the survivorship bias. In other words, the observational study settings are picking up on women that had survived and been on E plus P for multiple years. So, not, not to scare everyone and not to, not to actually diminish the role of observational studies in medical research. They are important hypothesis generating factors and we do learn a lot from them. But the key take home is, is we need to confirm those things in a well controlled setting. Okay? And that's where our patients, healthcare providers and bringing in volunteers for randomized clinical trials become so important because we have to do these things to be able to confirm truly what intervention effects are. So really the take home message for you all is this concept of an association versus causation. So many of us have heard this. We read about it in the newspaper, in the literature. Um, if we really want to truly determine causation, that requires a suitable interventional design. You cannot do this in just an observational study. You need to intervene on the process. Comparisons can only tell us about associations. But if we have the appropriate randomization, which I will talk about in just a minute, then we can start to infer and really gain confidence in the role of a treatment in modifying disease. Okay? And we have to be careful about even randomized clinical trial settings, right? Because we need to even be circumspect of identifying true mechanistic causes there. You know, I mean, just because you're randomizing doesn't mean you're always going to get the right answer. 
An example might be, for example, that if you've got a treatment that causes headaches, and because people have headaches, they are taking aspirin, and because they are taking aspirin, they have a lower risk of heart attack. It's not your treatment that's causing the lower risk of heart attack. It's because you are inferring an adverse event that's leading them to a differential therapy. So you have to think long and hard about what the mechanistic pathway is that you're treating in a randomized clinical trial okay, as you're going through. And that's what much of the talks today are actually focusing on. So, if we think about the level of evidence, um, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, this is just a reiteration of what I have said, level one evidence is our highest level of evidence. When we think about this from a regulatory perspective, this is what we are talking about. That's at least one properly designed randomized clinical trial. Level two evidence is a well-designed well non-randomized clinical trial. Well, that's basically an observational study. Okay. And level three evidence is actually listed there, um, opinions of respected authorities. And we often will quote evidence-based medicine. I, I would consider this eminence-based medicine. Um, and that doesn't really hold a whole lot of sway. You really need to bring the data and you need to understand empirically what's happening. And I would be remiss if I, if I were talking, you know, giving the clinical trials 101 here and, and not giving you a brief history of the legal requirements because I think about caregivers and healthcare providers and participants in clinical trials, you have to understand kind of the regulatory issues that have surrounded and developed our clinical trial process. Um, we started off very slowly, you know, the Wiley Act was simply a labeling act back in 1906. There was nothing to do with safety or efficacy um, in terms of regulating drugs and treatments. Uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act back in 1938, all that really started to regulate was a bit of safety didn't really deal with efficacy, whether a drug actually worked or a treatment actually worked. It really wasn't until Estes, Kefauver, and Harris and their Amendment Act in 1962, which was really brought on by thalidomide, which was given to women for uh, pregnancy, nausea, and sickness. And it was advertised, but it was not really looked at in a controlled clinical trial setting. And what had happened with thalidomide was the U.S. started getting reports from Australia and Asian countries that there were a lot of birth defects occurring among women that were taking thalidomide at the time. And so that was what Estes Kefauver had keyed into and said, oh, we need better have better regulation behind the efficacy of certain therapies and have a much stronger impact on their safety uh, evaluation. And so really the key terminology that came from that amendment is really the, the binding principle of the FDA today is the term substantial evidence and allowing for the approval of a new medication or treatment means evidence consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations, including clinical investigations, not just animal or lab-based investigations. And this is our guiding principle now that we deal with with regulatory. The FDA Amendments Act of 2007 is critical and it's going to become more critical, I say, in the AD setting, because it gave the FDA teeth to force sponsors to look at what we call post-marketing studies to actively survey how a drug does after it is approved for the general population and to look at the safety profile and efficacy profile of that drug. Now, it's not in a controlled trial setting, but is at least active surveillance as you look through. The FDA Amendments Act of 2007 allowed us to put, again, a responsibility on sponsors to do those studies as we go through. And the reason why I say it's going to become important in AD is because we are moving, as Dr. Cummings said, more along the earlier AD progression and treatment side of things. And so we're gonna to have to look at the long-term impact of those therapies that we may not be able to observe in a controlled trial setting. It will be after the general population observes that. So I'm gonna move fairly quickly through the phases of clinical trials just so we have an idea when we are talking about these things throughout the day, what we are really getting at. The, the phases of clinical trials as set up by regulatory have a very logical construct. Phase one is initial safety to see if there are obvious safety signals that would occur and then dose finding to try and find an optimal dose for a new therapy. Phase two are termed to be preliminary efficacy or further safety studies. I tend to think of them as screening trials. Okay. What you're looking for are drugs that are promising to experiment on in a larger population. 
Phase three studies are the ones that we often think about. These are the large studies that are going to the FDA for regulatory approval for the general population. The idea there is to truly establish effectiveness and efficacy. And then finally, phase four studies I mentioned a minute ago, these are post-marketing surveillance studies after approval of a drug, but active surveillance studies. Um, so phase one studies, I won't spend a lot of time on, but these are generally relatively small numbers of participants. Sometimes they're healthy participants. They're not even participants with the actual indication for the disease. Um, and the idea there is to look at what is a maximal tolerable dose oftentimes. In other words, how much of a drug can some, an, an individual take in um, before adverse events start coming forward. Phase two studies go a little bit farther, and they're looking for, again, hints of efficacy as we move through the process. These are, again, relatively small participants oftentimes, but sometimes, as you saw Dr. Cummings mentioned, a well-designed phase two study will often have up to 800, 1,000 patients in it. And that's because we want to be very sure about before we take the next step into a confirmatory setting. Okay. Sometimes they have no comparison groups, so what I'm kind of getting at here is there's a wide range of phase two studies. I'll give you one example here, Anavex 273. This was presented this year at the AAIC. This is a Sigma-1 receptor drug. Um, and so this was a phase, what, what, what some folks would title a phase 2A study. It's a very small study, okay? And so it was only 32 patients. And it's been reported these days as one of the first precision medicine Alzheimer's disease therapies on the market, or not on the market, but under investigation. So why are they saying that? Why is it precision medicine? Well, part of it is because after they had ran the 32 participant study, they went back and looked at the, the genomics of those individuals and the 32 individuals, and then they picked out a subpopulation of approximately 80% of people that had genetic variants for which the drug had a bigger effect. That's the precision medicine or personalized medicine is to say if we can use their genotypes maybe we can target the therapy slightly better. Um, so that was the subgroup finding there. And then they found effects on MMSE, as you'd heard about before, as, as well as the ADCS activities of daily living when they did that. Um, so this drug is gonna go into phase 2B slash 3 studies, but as Dr. Cummings said, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, it's a subgroup finding. And so there is a lower chance of replicability here. I'm hopeful, I would hope to see it work, but I'm, less confident in that because it is a post hoc subgroup finding. The flip side of this is like BAN 2401, which you heard about just a few minutes ago. This was a very large phase two study, 856 individuals assessing endpoints that are, cog are clinically meaningful. ADCOMS was mentioned earlier, as well as ADAS COG, as well as CDR sums of boxes. And they showed, as you had seen earlier, a resounding effect on amyloid beta, just an absolute resounding effect on amyloid beta. So there's a wide spectrum of phase two studies. And again, our phase three studies are really the confirmatory efficacy effectiveness studies. Um, generally, by regulatory standards, you have to have two large-scale phase three confirmatory studies that show consistent evidence for your treatment effect. They want duplication and replicability. Okay. And then finally, phase four are post-marketing studies. Um, and really what we're often monitoring for is serious, rare, serious events, things that we couldn't have picked up on in a controlled setting over a limited amount of time. Okay. So for those individuals that are thinking about trial participation, for healthcare providers that are thinking about advising uh, patients on trial participation, there are multiple mechanisms for ensuring the ethical treatment of study subjects. Dr. Cummings mentioned that we must have equipoise to do randomization. What that means is we don't really know the answer, right? That's the only way to ethically randomize people is because we don't know. We don't have strong evidence one way or another that a treatment is working or not. Because if we did, it would become unethical to randomize, okay? So we know that there are risks involved for patients, but what we try to do is minimize those risks as much as possible. There are multiple boards that deal with this before starting a study. There is the Institutional Review Board at any research institution that will oversee the protocol and look at the ethical obligations of the protocol, as well as a protocol review committee and oftentimes. During the conduct of a study, we have what's called a data safety monitoring board or an independent data monitoring committee that again has access and unblinded 
um, information on the study data as it is progressing. This was the idea behind the Women's Health Initiative. The Data Safety Monitoring Board were the ones that were able to pick up early on and stop that study, okay? As soon as they realized that there was a signal going the wrong way. And then finally, after studies are completed, in terms of looking at safety signals, that becomes regulatory in FDA's purview. Okay. So what are the essential clinical trial design elements? Um, first of all, I start off with saying that a clinical trial must answer a question, which means it has to be able to discriminate between viable hypotheses. <coughs> you often hear the saying, it was a felled clinical trial. A failed clinical trial is one that is not designed properly. It's not, it doesn't mean that the treatment didn't necessarily work. Just because the treatment didn't work, that's not a failed trial. We've learned something <laughs> along the way. A failed trial is one that is designed improperly so that we don't have an answer as to whether the treatment works or not. That is a failed trial. Okay? So we have to start off by saying, can we discriminate between those viable hypotheses? That requires careful specification of our study population, who we're enrolling, who we're trying to target, our outcomes of interest, the treatment regimen, how we're dosing individuals, how we're dose reducing individuals, how we're changing doses, how we're going to allocate individuals, how we're going to ascertain outcomes, and how we're going to compare between arms. So when we think about inclusion exclusion criteria, and I'm going to come back just shortly here to the FDA's guidance on early AD trials that came out just earlier this year in February of 2018. And a lot of that focus was on inclusion, exclusion, and the definition of the outcome. And that's why I want to focus on it here from a more general perspective, because you're going to see how it plays into the FDA's thinking currently on what they're advising sponsors when they're looking at new experimental treatments. So when we talk about inclusion, exclusion criteria for a study, we are talking about precisely defining the target population. Who are we going to be treating and intervening on? And I break this down into thinking about it from two perspectives. One is scientific and one is clinical. I bring it in both ways. From a scientific perspective, what we would like to have are patients that might yield the largest, largest response. We want to know, we want to have increased homogeneity. In other words, Dr. Cummings mentioned Joshua Grill's work on saying is there heterogeneity across the world in terms of patients and how they're reacting in trials. We would like to have homogeneity from a scientific perspective because that means that we reduce variance in a trial. But that starts to become at odds with the clinical perspective, and that is that our goal in a trial, too, should be able to generalize the safety outcomes and generalize the efficacy outcomes to the population we're ultimately going to treat at the end of the day. So in other words, you need to have broad representation in the trial of whoever you're planning to treat later on. So these things become a little bit of at odds. You say, I would like everybody to look the same, but that's not who ultimately is going to use that drug. So you need to be able to observe safety and efficacy in all individuals. So the ideal setting, setting when I go into a trial design is I say, look, a study sample should look like a random sample from the subpopulation of all the disease subjects that would ultimately be deemed suitable for intervention. That's who we should be thinking about in clinical trials and trying to enroll. So there should be negligible impact of restrictions due to clinical trial procedures. There should be negligible impact of restrictions due to the locale or clinical trial. And then finally, there should be a high participation rate by eligible participants. That's what you're trying to do in recruitment for clinical trials, those individuals that are likely to be treated. And so when we think about inclusion criteria, we should think about objective criteria of disease. Dr. Cummings mentioned this. We need to have a well-defined objective criteria of disease and who we're trying to target, their disease severity, which you will see come up in just a few moments and then contraindications for treatment. In other words, is there a reason that we shouldn't be treating with an experimental treatment if a, if a patient is already on another drug that might have a contraindication? Okay. And then exclusion criteria should also be, again, contraindications for treatment. Um, but requirements for evaluation of the outcome, we need to be able to assess the outcome on individuals that are entered into a study. If we cannot do that, then they should not be included into a clinical trial because we can't gain information on the outcome of interest. We need to think about requirements for compliance, but that gets very much into a generalizability issue. You, know, you can't just take the perfect compliers because that's not likely who's in the general population. We're humans, again, and we are imperfect. Um, and of course, individuals that are unwilling to provide informed consent are going to meet the uh, exclusion criteria for any study. In terms of choice of outcome, this gets very tricky in AD study settings, and I'm going to talk about it more with the with the FDA's advice. Um, I tend to think about choosing an outcome first by what is most clinically relevant in terms of an endpoint. 
When patients go into a, a, a trial setting, when an individual is prescribed a medicine, they want to have an impact on clinical outcome. Right? And so it's not a subclinical outcome. You know, if you change my blood pressure, I can't fill that from day to day. But if you change my risk of a heart attack at the end of the day, I'll be able to fill that whether I've had a heart attack or not. Right? Same thing is going to be true in AD settings. We'd like to have an endpoint for which the treatment is most likely to affect. And we'd also like to have an endpoint that we can accurately assess and measure at the end of the day. You need to have those things when you're choosing an endpoint. The problem for many of us, though, in, in trial design is that relevant clinical outcomes often take a very long time to manifest. And what that means is running very, very long clinical trials in order to come up with an answer. So that becomes difficult, and that motivates the use of what we will often call, in general, surrogate markers. Some people will call them biological markers. Some people will call them biomarkers. Um, this is, for example, you've heard about some of the studies that have used amyloid beta. Can anybody in this room fill how much their amyloid beta has risen or declined over the last 10 years? You cannot. It is not a clinical outcome, right? It is a surrogate biomarker outcome relevant to the disease. And so what we often want and hope for is if we're going to choose an outcome that is a biomarker like amyloid beta, is we hope that it's what we call in the clinical trial setting an ideal surrogate. What that means is the disease has one pathway and it moves right through that surrogate marker. So Alzheimer's disease is primarily moving through amyloid beta, and amyloid beta is ultimately affecting dementia and cognitive impairment and functioning. Okay. What we have to worry about, though, are alternative pathways. And we have learned this lesson very hard in clinical trials when we're thinking about surrogates. Again, our ideal setting is we have this one pathway and we intervene on it and we can measure the changes in that biomarker and that will tell us ultimately whether we've cured disease or not in the clinical outcomes. But the things we need to worry about, there's lots of different pathways by which a disease might act. It might not all be going through just amyloid beta, for example, okay, in the AD setting. And so we can run into quote unquote inefficient surrogates. In other words, we may be impacting the surrogate later down the road between the surrogate and the clinical outcome. And we have learned lessons the hard way. There also sometimes are alternative pathways for the intervention that can become harmful. In other words, it looks like we're treating the surrogate very well, but we're ultimately harming individuals on the clinical outcomes. That has happened, okay? And there's something, a very famous clinical trial called the CAS trial, where they looked at econide and flecainide. And what they did was they looked and said, if we can reduce the amount of arrhythmias in people, that should reduce their risk of mortality by heart attacks. That trial did reduce the risk of arrhythmias in people by about 50%. It was impressive. And what happened? It stopped early. Why? Because there was a twofold increase in the death rate associated with econide and flecainide. And so that was a dangerous surrogate, arrhythmias in that case. I'll very quickly go through, since I'm, I'm going to be running out of time and I want to get to primarily the FDA's guidance here, comparison groups. We can think about no comparison groups. Historical controls are the concept of using data that we've had in the past. This is very much an observational type of study setting, though, because people change over time in cohorts. Sometimes we're lucky and we can use internal controls. We can use an individual as their own control, but that's not often in the AD setting. So really where we are is concurrent control groups. So we want to be able to compare two or more therapies or arms across control groups. And that's the most common trial setting, okay, is to have these concurrent or control groups as we go through. And then we assign treatments through randomization. And the ICH is the International Conference on Harmonization. These are, these are our guiding principles in trial design. And they say, yeah, you better use blinding and you better use randomization. And this is important for potential participants of trials. Because a, a, a trial participant inherently wants to know, am I on drug or am I not on drug? I mean, that's a, that's a natural question to ask in a randomized setting. Or, a, or even, should I be randomized? I'd like to have the drug. You know, if I'm going in, I want to be treated with what you think is the newest, greatest thing that you're looking for in an intervention. Well, we have randomization and blinding because they protect against bias. They allow us to make that causal inference statement. It is a critical component to trial design. It is not because we're trying to withhold information, it is because it is key to the scientific objective of what we are doing. Okay. <laughs> and so, randomization should always be concealed just prior to initiation. And 
I will leave it um, at just the simple point of saying that randomization you can think of as flipping a coin. We get fancier in terms of our randomization. We do things like adaptive randomization, stratification. I have examples in the slides for you on that, but I won't go through them necessarily here. Um, it's really more for the clinical trial practitioner that would go through the adaptive randomization and baseline randomization. Um, luckily, Dr. Cummings saved me some time because he talked about band 2401. That was a new innovation in terms of using adaptive randomization for allocating different patients to different dose groups. Okay. And so these things are coming along in the AD trial literature. Um, they are not perfect. We need to learn a lot about these different randomization schemes. I will tell you that from a statistical perspective, but they are there. And then blinding, again, is the concept of hopefully in a, at least a double-blind experiment, neither the participant nor the treating clinician knows or the investigator knows what treatment the study participant is on. This is absolutely critical because once you know that, we have things called the placebo effect that can infer our, our can, can confound our inference for causality, and we also have bias from clinical judgment. A lot of the things that we do in AD research are from clinical judgment and they're subjective. Um, we get creative sometimes with blinding. So if you think about methylene blue, that was a phase three study. There was an anti-tau drug, an AD. Um, methylene blue is actually a dye as well. And it turns out that it created blue urine in people that took it. So how do you blind a patient now when you've randomized them to methylene blue? They say, well, my urine is blue. Well, you have to become creative. And so the, the answer there on the creative is that the placebo is no longer a true quote unquote placebo. The answer is a placebo that contains a very minimal amount of methylene blue, just enough to turn their urine blue, okay? So that no one knows. But we go to long ranks or long lengths to try and guarantee blinding. So I will just very quickly go to my special challenges in early AD because they're gonna set a lot of the stage for what you're gonna hear about the rest of the day. And they really come down to who are we including in these AD trials as we move along the spectrum of disease? What is the outcome definition? How do we assess it? And how long should the trial be? So the plot there I have is a very famous plot for uh, AD researchers. That's by Cliff Jack from his publication, where he talked about what the occurrence of different symptoms in a patient are as the disease progresses, as Alzheimer's disease progresses. And you can see that biomarkers come first, like amyloid beta, and the very last thing is functioning. So the FDA's guidance really says, start with your target population, think about the earliest stage, which would be people that only have biomarker symptoms. They don't have cognitive symptoms, they don't have functioning symptoms yet, okay? Then move up a stage and think about biomarker symptoms and then also cognitive symptoms but not functional which tends to come last along the line that's stage two stage three would be biomarker symptoms cognitive symptoms as well as functional impairment to some measurable degree and then finally stage four being overt dementia in these patients and then they said their guidance truly allows for the openness to outcomes by what is most likely to be affected. It was those principles that I talked about. If you're in stage one, you're likely, unlikely to see clinical and functional symptom changes because nobody has them yet. It would take you a very long time. So what you're looking at is a trial of a certain duration. The biomarker potential effect could be large, but you're unlikely to see much on the cognitive effects. Now, you're putting a lot of faith in the surrogate marker, so you have to do a lot of long-term surveillance follow-up in that case, okay? So that is our challenge. That will be our challenge as we go forward with these types of just biomarker-only endpoints in early AD studies in the stage one folks. Stage two, the FDA has given guidance to say, look at the biomarker, but then also look at some change in the cognitive status. You're moving farther along that line. So it's something detectable that you might be able to see in a reasonably timed clinical trial, okay? And then finally, stage three says you need to be looking at both cognitive and some change in function, as well as the biomarker potentially, okay? And so, hope just in summary here, the take home message here truly is clinical trials, they are our gold standard. They are our gold standard for inferring cause and effect and truly making decisions about disease and new therapies. We need to focus on things like the target population, the outcome of interest, and compared to you're gonna hear that theme throughout the rest of the talks today. Our design elements, how we get there is randomization and blinding, and that is a sacrifice, if you will, on a participant's part. In other words, they have to be willing to undergo randomization and blinding. 
And our recent guidelines, I think, are moving us in the right direction. They're tailoring responses and target population. We do need to be cautious about long-term follow-up and surrogate endpoints. Um, but I think that we're moving well into the, the right direction. So thank you. We'll take time for one or two questions. Asking questions lowers your amyloid. <laughs> Even if you ask them of a statistician? That's an anecdote. Yeah. Not <laughs> or does everyone want coffee? I'm always willing to ask a question. Fantastic. Uh, you talked about anecdotal observations. When there is an anecdotal observation that does not produce a new drug, but uses something that's relatively cheap and available, how do you get a clinical trial financed? Um, you apply for funding. So I'll give you a perfect example. So Joshua Grill and I right now, we are the PIs of something called the NEAT trial, which is looking at nicotinamide, which is a natural supplement. It's exactly what you're talking about. And there has been anecdotal evidence. And so you have to make the case, though, for the mechanistic pathway of why that would work, right? I mean, before we would finance such a drug. But it is possible. It's just a clear hypothesis and mechanistic action as to why it might be beneficial. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Um, I have a question regarding informed consent. Yeah. Um, how does informed consent change as individuals move through their disease? Ah, uh, that's, that's critical, and I think actually the, the man to my right is an expert in this setting. Um, what I can tell you more so is how, I can talk to you about my experiences, how informed consent changes as you progress through a trial. So I, as a, a data safety monitoring board member, have multiple times advocated for alterations in the informed consent process because we learn more about the disease and the intervention as we're going through the trial. So that definitely occurs. But in terms of cognitive impairment, perhaps Joshua would actually, I mean, you'd be the, one of the foremost authorities that I could think of on it. We have several today who, uh, who could offer uh, added commentary, and I'll encourage them to do that when they, when they take the podium. But, um, you know, informed consent is obviously a critical aspect of an ethical study, period, and it's perhaps um, even more important when investigational drugs are used. Um, informed consent is a process. It's a process through which we give people adequate information to make a decision about whether they want to be in the study. And as Dan alluded to, ethical guidelines mandate that any information that changes during the course of the study must be communicated to people through the course of that study so they can make, they're continuing to make a decision whether to continue their participation. And so we always want to arm people with information they need to make that decision. In a disease that affects the brain and affects cognitive performance, there's an added burden of determining whether someone has the capacity to, to make that decision. And there are processes through which we assess that capacity. Um, and thankfully, here in California especially, we have opportunity to enroll people in clinical trials when they no longer have the capacity to make a decision about participating in that study through the use of something called surrogate consent. We don't actually have a full lecture on that today. We thought about that. Um, we are going to have a panel where I'll talk a little bit more about these things, and we'll hear from people who have undergone the process of informed consent, chosen to participate in a study, and in some cases face a decision about whether to continue participating in that study. So, so thank you for that question. So um, it, is, uh, it is time for a coffee break. Thanks again to Dr. Gillen. Thank you.